delighted to be here. Um, I want to share sort of big picture thinking, social historical perspective, as well as some hands-on tactical guidance around working in quantum, right? So I've been involved in quantum for about three years or so. I left IBM uh, when Jeopardy, uh, when IBM Watson crushed the Jeopardy champion. So I've sort of been involved in AI and bleeding edge tech for several years, but let's, let's jump into it. Here's the agenda. I know it looks like a lot of topics. I'm going to go through them. I have a lot of material I want to share with you. Certainly technology and careers. I want to talk about the evolution of computers. I want to give you a perspective on the four main quantum application areas from a go-to-market perspective. Talk about big picture addressable problem sets, what the implications really for quantum computing might be. Trending, where is the funding going? Is there a pony in here? Do investors think this is a viable uh, solution? area. Moving technology to the mainstream, I have some fun screen grabs from 70s and 80s marketing material to give you a sense of how advanced technologies move into the market. And then the money shot is what I call the evolving quantum workforce ecosystem. If you're going to screen grab any of my charts, that's the one you should do. And I'll point it out when we get there again. And then I have real world job openings to share with you based on the four, they're mapped to the four main quantum application areas. So, and then key takeaways. So, Let's get started. Technology and careers. So the concept of work, right? Jobs, careers, that's our meta topic here, the secrets to working in quantum. The meta topic of work has been constantly reinvented, right? And it's always driven by technology since we were wandering around in the Pleistocene wilderness trying to track down something larger than us that we could kill and eat and make clothing out of. So in this case, the technology was maybe sharp sticks, right? Spears sort of the, the bleeding edge technology. It's part of a process that's going on for thousands of years. Here's a cobot with a human thinking about, you know, how to collaborate to solve, and this, this case looks like a manufacturing problem. Anyway, I want you to keep that perspective in mind as we go through this talk, right? So we have any history buffs in the audience? Anyone want to guess who delivered this quote? I refuse to issue a patent for fear it will put my poor subjects out of work. Feel free to comment in the uh, chat if you want. If any, any history of us want to take a stab at who might have said this, I want you to guess who said it, when they said it, and what they said it about. I'll sing a few bars of the Jeopardy theme, let you think about it. Bum, 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 bum. Anyway, here's the answer. It was... Queen Elizabeth the first, and she said it about a mechanized knitting machine, and she said it in 1589. So a monarch with control over what kinds of technologies get adopted in her culture, in her country, in the business world. So that's you know 430 odd years ago. We take a pause. Some people are feeling the same way about Chat GPT today. How do we manage that technology? So think about that for a moment. Moving on, this is historical context, and then this is a bit of an eye chart, and I won't belabor it, but if any of you are interested in this kind of trending, there's a great book called Technological Revolutions in Financial Capital by a woman named Carlotta Perez. She's a Venezuelan economist. She taught at Cambridge. She has some great videos on YouTube. She's broken the past 350 or so years into five um, periods of innovation, crash, and resolution or standardization and deployment. So it's an interesting concept. And again, it's for context, this has been going on for a long, long time, this kind of thing. Quantum is part of a pattern that's been you know, happening for literally hundreds of years. Okay, so that's a cool book, check it out. Thomas Friedman, the New York Times journalist and author says more people can compete, connect and collaborate in more ways for less money from more places than ever before. Again, meta perspective on work and careers for you guys. Right. Let's talk about the evolution of computers. We're going to shift gears a little bit. My second pop quiz is this. Anybody know what this is? I almost bore you with the Jeopardy theme again. No, <laughs> you're shaking your head. Okay. This is something called the Antikythera mechanism. It's considered the first analog computer. It was found in like 100 feet of seawater off a Greek island called Antikythera. Uh, and it's 
a device that was built probably 250 BC and could predict the orbits of the four planets closest to the sun, uh, cycles for Olympics. Um, it could uh, determine, you know, when solar eclipses were happening. There's a cool video on YouTube, actually. Some British scientists, based on x-rays, built a version of this. They think, you know, what it might have looked like, how it might have functioned. So anyway, again, for context, the first computer, if you will, um, analog, you know, computing device looked like this. And it's, you know, 2,500 years old almost. So let's talk more recently about the evolution of computers. So 1820s, 18 to 1940s, mechanical devices, then vacuum tubes, then transistors and uh, integrated circuits. And then today we're in sort of the quantum state era, if you will. So let's talk about mechanical devices, again, in the context of humans creating machines that help us think better and solve problems. I was in London a couple of weeks ago at the Economist Commercializing Quantum event and made a pilgrimage to admire this. This is the difference engine number two. It was a device that was designed by a British inventor and mathematician, Charles Babbage. He designed it in 1847 to can add and subtract numbers up to 31 digits by turning a crank on the side. It's eight columns of stainless steel and brass uh, discs, if you will, that rotate to do the math. And it's quite a remarkable piece of equipment. And again, presages, predates the kinds of quantum computing solutions we're developing today, historical perspective, right? Worth mentioning that this person, anybody know who this is? This is Ada Lovelace. She was Lord Byron's daughter. She worked with Charles Babbage and is considered the first computer programmer. I put her in here in the interest of gender parity, right? Encouraging you to think about smart women who played a role in developing scientific solutions. She's considered the first sort of programmer. If you will. She wrote notes about how to use Babbage's later device, an analytical engine, to solve uh, you know, mathematical problems. Pretty, pretty interesting. I'd look her up. If you don't know about her, you should investigate her. Well, let's talk vacuum tubes. So with the first triode vacuum tube, the Audion, this is what it looked like in uh, 1907. It led to this, which is ENIAC, the first programmable electronic general purpose computer used to calculate ballistic trajectories, among other things. Uh, you programmed it by patching and unpatching these cords right in and out of these bays. Uh, took up an entire room, but it was a breakthrough, right? It was a technological marvel at the time, 1945. Fast forward, 1950s, transistors. This is the first transistor at Bell Labs, Bardeen and Bretagne, 1947. Then Intel creating integrated circuits, 1971. Again, predating, presaging our modern technology it led to, among other things, this, the IBM personal computer you know, 40 odd years ago in 1981. This was again, a remarkable breakthrough. Oh my goodness, you can have a computer that fits on your desk that you can work on at home or in your office. Remarkable, what an amazing thing. So nowadays you wear it on your wrist, right? Apple Watch and Google Watches. And I mean, you have more technology on your wrist than ENIAC brought to bear in 1945. So remarkable. Nowadays, we're sort of in the quantum state era, if you will. And these are some screenshots to give you a sense that quantum is a constellation, right? It's not one thing. It's like saying, what is biology? Well, it's lots of different applications and solutions based on quantum mechanics, quantum physics for sure. But so superconducting uh, quantum computer on the right, uh, trapped ions on the left, uh, cold atoms on the bottom there an image representing quantum networks on the lower left and in the middle, quantum sensors that are be used, being used in all kinds of applications from looking for diamonds and gold and oil to medical applications. And we'll talk about that in a little, little bit. Let's talk about the four main quantum application areas in terms of work, in terms of where you might get a job, where you might have a career. There are lots of ways to slice and dice quantum information science. Hardware software services is certainly an approach, but these are the main go-to-market 
uh, application areas. That's why I've called these out. The implication being, these are areas where you might work, where you might have a career, right? Certainly quantum computing, which is the darling of the press. It gets all the limelight, if you will. But clocks and sensors, which have been around for like 50 odd years, certainly atomic clocks, which are quantum devices, uh, are being used in really interesting, innovative ways. Networks, memories, and repeaters have tremendous potential. We'll talk about that. And then cybersecurity, which is getting a lot of focus all over the world, especially in the U.S. Around, you know, now that NIST has released their four approved algorithms to deal with post-quantum crypto cryptography. So let's dig in. So quantum computers, it's a new technology for computing. It leverages the laws of quantum mechanics, it provides exponential power performance, probably even more than exponential. Uh, it enables completely new computing capabilities. These are some screenshots of what some of these quantum computers look like. There are multiple modalities, obviously, seven or so qubit modalities alone. Uh, worth mentioning quantum supremacy in this context. So quantum advantage and quantum supremacy. In 2019, Google's Sycamore quantum computer performed a calculation in 200 seconds that a classical computer would have required 10,000 years to complete. Now, to be fair, IBM immediately refuted and said, oh, well, our superconducting, uh, you know, su supercomputer could have done it in two and a half days. But the implication being any situation where you're capturing, collecting, rationalizing, manipulating data, this has tremendous implications broadly, right? We're probably going to get to quantum advantage um, before we get to quantum supremacy. And the idea also is that they'll be co-located, right? It's not like... Quantum computers are going to replace, do everything that a classical computer could do, but only better. So we'll talk about that in more detail in a moment. Quantum sensors, it's a new generation using quantum systems. It's orders of magnitude more sensitive than classical sensors. Uh, again, the screen grab is showing a, a group looking for, using quantum sensors, looking for gold underground, right? Use cases include uh, monitoring subtle gravitational changes, looking for natural resources under the earth, much more detailed cardiac imaging for a specific example, and then more uh, powerful brain scans. Really fascinating story about a company in England using quantum sensors to improve MRI performance. The third area is quantum networks. So using photons to send and receive information encoded in quantum states. A lot of work going on all over the world to develop this kind of protocol. It enables unhackable encrypted messages over long distances. It facilitates networked quantum computers, a very exciting application as well. Imagine if you have uh, quantum computers as nodes on a quantum network. And again, will augment but not replace the classical internet. And finally, quantum cybersecurity, PQC, post-quantum cryptography, right? At some point, we're going to reach what some people call Y2Q, where quantum computers are going to be able to break the current RSA and ECC encryption protocols. It's going to have huge implications for financial services companies, for national security, um, health, you know, research data, all going to be at risk. There are lots of companies now focused on what they call the Harvest Now Decrypt Later Challenge. Companies and hackers and non-state actors stealing data from companies or organizations that they plan to later, you know, decrypt and use for ransomware attacks or sell to competitors could be you know, military secrets could be healthcare data. So PQC getting a lot of focus now. And again, NIST is the main arbiter of what these post-quantum quantum safe algorithms are going to be. And lots of career and job opportunities in these spaces. Let's talk about addressable problem sets. Take a step back and talk sort of more abstractly. So there are basically two sets of problems. Problem to solve every day. And sometimes the calculations are challenging, but we can solve them in a reasonable amount of time. Then there are problems that are so hard, we don't even really bother thinking about them, thinking about solving them. So let me give you some examples. Uh, this, by the way, this is in computational mathematics. These are called NP-hard, these problems, right? Non-deterministic polynomial time hardness. It's like, we can never figure that out. So why would we bother? But quantum computing especially gives us the potential poses the option, perhaps, to solve some of these problems. Some examples, optimization. So this is a classic, the traveling salesman problem, one of the most intensely studied problems in optimization, formulated in the 30s. 
basically describes how a salesperson that needs to find the optimum route around Europe might do that. So with 15 cities, you've got around 43 billion possible routes. If you add five more cities, you then have 121 quadrillion possible routes. So in theory, quantum computers could you know, do the math on this and implications for logistics, for manufacturing, for transportation uh, are tremendous, right? Drug discovery. Currently takes about 10 years and $2.4 billion to bring a drug to market. With quantum computers, and there's a company called Polaris QB using D-Waves annealing quantum solution, and they're looking at accelerating the time to drug discovery with implications for cures for cancer, maybe, genetic diseases, Alzheimer's, a vaccine for the next pandemic. You know, imagine grandchildren saying, what was cancer, Grandpa? Hmm. Sounds familiar. Finance, certainly there's a lot of focus on finance. There are companies that are just um, mainly focused on this vertical. Terra Quantum is one, Multiverse is another, using quantum computers for portfolio optimization, for designing more robust investment strategies, for improved fraud detection, for running complex Monte Carlo simulations. Again, tremendous implications for financial services. And then communication, this is a fun animated GIF of the quantum network that the Chicago Quantum Exchange is building between Argonne National Lab and Endpoint on a toll road outside Chicago. This has actually been expanded, but the idea is they're developing a secure, fast, immutable network to transmit data. It could be tied to finance, to healthcare, to legal information, to military secrets, right? Again, career opportunities, right? That's the theme. Think of that. All these examples represent possible jobs, possible careers. This is my favorite, actually, predicting the weather. We had a, a managing director from Accenture, the uh, managed consulting firm, speak at one of our Inside Quantum Technology events about the power of quantum computing to help predict the weather. So currently, we can predict the weather you know, with sort of 85% accuracy three to five days out, maybe 60% accuracy 10 days out. But imagine if you could predict the weather for a mm, hundred years. I mean, certainly there's stochastic variables that would play into this, but the idea is implications for agriculture, for transportation, for environment. L.L. Bean, right? The American company that makes uh, sporting goods and outdoor equipment. Imagine if they could say, well, you know, the winter of 2038 is gonna be really cold. So we want to make sure that those red reindeer sweaters get manufactured maybe 20% more than we've done in the past. So put in the order and implications for supply chain, manufacturing resources are tremendous. So a bit phantasmagoric, but worth thinking about. Let's talk about trending. So Bob Suter, who was uh, formerly at IBM and is now the VP and Chief Quantum Advocate in Flexion, formerly called Quanta, says... Many industries working with quantum computers, including banking, capital markets, insurance, automotive, aerospace, and energy. In years to come, the breadth and depth of the industries leveraging quantum, and this is a bit large, right, will continue to grow. Total investment, just from a monetary perspective, you know, it's been trending upward over the past 10 years, thanks to Quantum Insider for this information, by the way. They say, you know, $59 million invested in 2012, now $2.1 billion in 2022, last year. Number of deals went from 11 in 2012 to 79 in 2022. And it's a worldwide effort. So basically, no matter where you sit on the planet, there's something going on with quantum. And it ranges from comparatively small amount, $6 million in Thailand, to China, which is the leading investor in quantum, according to our data. It's $15 billion dollars target on developing quantum information science technologies. And as you can see, it's a range, but it's all over. Again, career implications. And a lot of these jobs related to these funded efforts uh, can be done remotely. So big focus, big investment, big career opportunities. Again, a bit of an eye chart, but I wanna share with you potential employers, right? These are all companies that are working in quantum information science that need smart people like you. So worth pointing out the, the QPUs, right? This is a call out around current qubit modalities, superconducting, IBM Rigetti, oxyquantum circuits, but then other approaches, other modalities, ion traps, neutral atoms, 
silicon, photonics. There are other. Arrow Q is electrons on helium. Really interesting approach. Quantum brilliance, nitrogen vacancy, and diamonds. But again, all these ancillary and adjacent companies, cryogenics, building test benches and deal fridges, lasers, um, and then application software. So again, an eye chart, but a, to get you excited that there's a lot of opportunity, a lot of companies focus on this technology, which translates to possible careers and jobs. Let's talk about moving technology into the mainstream. So these are screen grabs from ads in the 70s and 80s. The meta message is any innovative technology moving into the general marketplace is going to go through bumps in the road. It's going to be rough. It's not going to be smooth. And quantum is experiencing the same kinds of challenges today. So lower right. So who do you know anyone that's got a Juki 6100 printer? No. Uh, upper left, imagine paying $3,398 for a 10 megabyte hard disk. Wow. Royal McBee in the middle. Uh, I don't think I ever met anybody who's working on a Royal McBee computer. That's a brand that's gone, right? Using Isaac Asimov here to pitch Radio Shack computers. My favorite is uh, Apple saying that Thomas Jefferson probably would have done a better job writing the Declaration of Independence if he had an Apple computer to help him. Anyway, the idea is it's got to deliver business value, the technology solution, right? Um, and that some of these companies, quantum companies today, are going to go out of business. Some are going to be bought. Some are going to consolidate, combine. Uh, and some are, might turn into the next Google or Microsoft. I think in the upper left, the screen grab says it all. It's Microsoft had a, something called multi-plan. And this executive leaning on his computer saying, Microsoft Multiplan allows me to explore more alternatives in less time. I think it leads to better management decisions. At the end of the day, that's the kind of response you want to hear from clients about quantum, quantum solutions, right? So moving on, let's talk about the evolving quantum workforce ecosystem. As I said before, this is the money shot, right? This is, you're going to do a screen grab. I would encourage you to take a screenshot of this. This is my take on the adjacent and ancillary skill sets that are needed to move quantum forward, no matter which of the four modalities uh, you're in. Like any business, these are businesses and they need people to do lots of different things to drive the business model. So certainly at the core are scientists and researchers, you know, many coming out of universities, uh, out of corporate R&D labs, maybe. Um, you need executives to kind of run the companies, C-suite and founders, people to start companies, and then people to come in and know how to run a business. You need sales in the upper right, business development, right? Someone's got to go to a client with a checkbook and say, this is the value that our technology is going to deliver. And whether you're a big company like IBM with 400,000 odd employees over the world, or Cole Quantum, which is like a comparatively smaller company, 120 people, uh, you've got to sell this to clients, right? UX design, they're companies that are focused on how do people touch and interact and manipulate this technology. That's a big area of focus, human computer design, interaction. Education, right? The one, um, you know, protocol that, that enables all other protocols, if you will. You can learn about quantum, uh, MIT and Caltech obviously have courses, but there's lots of online courseware available, Coursera, LinkedIn Learning. Maybe you're interested in regulatory and policy conversations. So the Department of Defense, Department of Energy, Department of Commerce are all thinking about how you manage and regulate this new technology. The box under the scientists and researchers is what I call the picks and shovels, if you will. Lasers, dilution refrigerators, test benches, lasers. I mean, companies like Montana, Montana Instruments, Destin who makes lasers, Maybell makes dilution refrigerators. This stuff is required to move this technology forward. And it may not be uh, as exotic or romantic as some of the other uh, technologies associated with quantum, but it's absolutely necessary. We're hearing this, the uh, CEO of Besson say that his most valuable employee is a woman who runs his test bench to make sure everything looks and works the way it's supposed to before it goes out to a client. Comms and PR in the lower left. Maybe you can write about this. Uh, marketing and branding. How do you articulate the value prop in 
terms that lay people who may not have PhDs in particle physics or whatever can understand. That's a key uh, focus area for these companies. Investing, we're going to talk a little bit more about people doing this kind of work, but you know, big banks are interested in how this is going to drive their business model and provide value to clients. And then strategy consulting, management consulting firms like McKinsey, Accenture, EY, BCG, KPMG, Bain, on and on. Um, but they're the ones, many people say, that are actually really making money in the current state of the quantum information science landscape, if you will. Because they're going in and talking to senior execs with big P&Ls, right, profit and loss responsibility, and saying, well, how will this impact your business strategy going forward in the longer term, five years out? longer even so anyway that's uh, I, what i want to say to you the net of this slide is there are lots of ways to get involved lots of ways to contribute your skills don't have to be in physics or mechanical engineering or software development if you have skills in lots of other areas you can certainly um, engage and get involved and find meaningful employment and do interesting work in quantum you look i see there's a comment in yeah, yeah, I'm going to definitely mention Circa for sure. Uh, so these are some real people that are doing real work in quantum across a range of roles. Maria Schultz, and you should follow all of them. You should reach for them on LinkedIn, try to connect with them, and at, at the very least, follow them. These are thought leaders in the space. So Maria Schultz is a senior researcher. She works at University of Durban and Natal in South Africa, but she also works with Xanadu, a Canadian-based quantum computing company. Catherine Londigan is a CMO at Zapata, a leading quantum software company. Jerry Chow is uh, at IBM Quantum. He's a director of quantum infrastructure. Again, approachable guy. Will Zhang in the upper right is a former student of Bob Kuke, who you may know is the chief scientist at Continuum. I describe him as the Elvis Presley of quantum computing, if you will. He's the head of quantum research at Goldman Sachs. I saw him at a webinar probably a year and a half ago, and his opening line was, bring me something, I have a checkbook. Goldman Sachs, Golden Slacks. It's one of the most successful investment banks on the planet. They're looking for ways to drive value for clients as well as improve internal processes, right? Farai Mazendu, he's the president of One Quantum Africa. One Quantum is a worldwide organization looking to promote and encourage involvement in and value for quantum-related technologies. Patty Lee, she's a chief scientist uh, uh, running technology development continuum. So again, real people, again, connect with these people, follow these people, follow these companies and uh, learn more about what they're doing. Let's talk about real world job openings, right? And I'm gonna map these to the four main modalities that I described before. So quantum computers, continuum, if you know or don't know, is a company that was formed by the merger of Honeywell Quantum Computing and Oxford Quantum, which is a software company. So Honeywell has a trapped ion computer, H2, I think is their latest version. Um, they're a worldwide company. They are looking for an optics lab engineer, for example, but they're also looking for a senior accounting specialist, someone to help manage the books, keep track of the in, inflows and outflows, right? So again, not just scientists, that's my message. Zapata, so here to quantum computers, they're a leading software company. They're looking for a senior quantum ops engineer, for sure. Uh, but they also need a part-time office manager. If you get your foot in the door doing this, maybe, it might lead to a role as a research intern. Again, moving up the value chain, if you have interest and some skills in this area, this these might be opportunities you could explore. Let's talk computer centers. Some, someone mentioned Circa Magnetics. Yes, what an amazing company this is. So they've developed... Uh, a head-mounted device, a quantum sensor, right, that they're using to detect childhood epilepsy. Remarkable. They're looking for a mechanical engineer, a software engineer, a quality engineer. They just, I was just in London, again, at the quantum event that The Economist ran, an organization called Quantum Exponential, working with the Institute of Physics, gave this company a 10,000 pound award for being the most innovative quantum-based uh, company in their competition, their competition, right? So they're going to get this money and they're going to get um, workspace and accelerator kind of environment, access to VCs and access to mentors. This is quite a remarkable 
uh, advancement using quantum. Uh, a Q control, if you're into sensors, again, this is an Australian based company and they're looking for a staff automation scientist, right? Quantum sensing. Um, they're also looking for a senior program manager, proposals and contracts, right? So this is an area that I don't think gets a lot of attention, but in quantum, you still need people to run programs who can deal with a client and a budget and a deliverable, get something out the door, built, tested, and delivered, you know, on time and on budget. This company just won a contract. It's a while ago now, but they won a contract from the Australian government to build quantum-based sensors for the moon to Mars supply chain. So think about that, the space economy. That's a pretty interesting application for quantum sensors if you're into this kind of uh, technology. Talk about quantum networks. And again, lots of companies exploring this space. Funect is a company based in New York. They're in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. They're building out a quantum network using existing fiber provided by Verizon. They have opportunities. They're looking for an optomechanical engineer, quantum optics laboratory assistant. Uh, you should follow them. Eden Figueroa is a professor at SUNY Stony Brook, leading his efforts along with Noel Goddard. She's the CEO. Uh, quite an interesting company doing great work. And again, just one example of quantum network application. Maybe you're into quantum cybersecurity. A company called Crypt, also based in New York, uh, is looking for talented people, full stack engineers, a product owner. Again, not just science, but someone to take this to market and help with product development. So, and these are just examples of where there's opportunity in these four modalities, if you will, in quantum. I want to end with this, my favorite. Rigetti is a superconducting quantum company uh, based in California. They're looking for, you know, roles in with science training, a science background, quantum test engineer. But this is my favorite, and I've never seen anything like this before. They call this the future open position. So what this is, is they're looking for smart, talented, interested, passionate people who might want to work in quantum. And what they want you to do is post your resume so that if and when they need someone with your skills, they know how to get a hold of you. Maybe they get a new order for 100,000 widgets. They have a new partnership. They get a new funding round. They have an executive hire that changes the portfolio, changes the direction of the company. They want to know how to get a hold of you. If you have skills they might use to drive the business model. So I would encourage all of you interested to immediately go to the Rigetti career page and post your resume in this future open position area. So that's a lot of data. Key takeaways. Quantum information science is a growing field. There are many opportunities and more emerging and across different disciplines and certainly different verticals. Um, get ready to work in different settings and different roles. You know, you may join as a as a researcher and find yourself in a business development role and join as a UX designer and find you're doing comms and PR. Be prepared to move from discipline to discipline within the quantum environment. Keep learning, keep exploring. And the final point is network, 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 right? An adage that's oft described as showbiz, but is true today in every business and especially in quantum is it's not what you know, it's who you know. So build your network, there's lots of interesting conversations going on around quantum on LinkedIn, in Medium, Substack, lots of really interesting, smart people carrying on conversations around what this technology is and what it can do. So a little um, unabashed self-promotion. I host something called the Quantum Tech Pod, where I interview C-suite execs at leading quantum companies. I'm about to publish my 50th episode. I can put the URL in the chat. Uh, I also host something called Office Hours for the Quantum Economic Development Consortium. Uh, we do this program on the last Thursday of the month. It's a way to connect quantum information science students with mentors in the private sector to have casual 30-minute conversations about moving from academia into the private sector or to working in a national lab. Our next session is going to be the last Thursday of June, June 29th, so put that on your calendar. And then finally, Connect with me, connect with me on LinkedIn, send me an email, here's my email address, and uh, look forward to seeing all the great work that you do driving quantum information science to the next level. I see you all in the quantum enabled future. Thanks for your time.
Thank you. Thank you very much for a very nice, fascinating talk. And we have time for questions. Um, Great. Have... So um, I will read the questions from the chat. So could you give an idea about how quantum sensors are already developed or what the current state of the art for medical applications? Well, I think the one that Circa is doing is certainly is um, is in the forefront, right? It's, it's sort of exponentially more powerful MRIs, right? Simply put. Um, and they're doing work. There's another company, I, I think it, based in England as well, that's doing um, quantum-enabled MRIs for detecting tumors and for doing bone scans. Uh, I'd say... You know, I'm not as familiar with the details of, of what people are doing in that space, but you can certainly Google it. And Circa is a company you should you should follow. Actually, David Liu saying they're separate QPS systems. You want to respond, David, in the chat or turn on your mic? But there there are lots of really interesting developments going on. Quantum sensors and GPS, they're working on putting together sensors that will work in GPS denied environments like underwater, right? Or even uh, in space. There was Sandbox AQ CEO, Jack Hittery was talking recently about working with the British Arctic Survey, BAS, to develop a GPS solution that'll work in a um, GPS denied environment, I guess, under the ice in the Arctic Circle. As soon as you go, I think a meter down, GPS becomes not viable, right? There's also the um, AFRL, the Air Force Research Laboratory under Michael Hayduck. They're working on uh, GPS denied environments using quantum solutions as well. So thank you. Uh, the next question is quantum computation and NP hard problems don't go well together. Any reference on why you suggest that quantum computations is good for them? Wait, is that in the chat? Let me see. Yes, it is in the chat. Scroll it down. was uh, 1620. Okay, let's see. I don't see it. Can you can you read it again? Uh, yes, of course. Quantum computation and NP hard problems don't go well together. We hear it. Please give any reference on why you suggest that quantum computation is good for them. Yes. So, Aritra posed this question. The implication is that NP hard problems can be solved because using quantum computers because it can capture manipulate data at a scale never before possible right so you could put together the variables around optimization around drug discovery around weather prediction uh, and and come up with solutions based on the ability to manipulate large amounts of data which is not possible with a classical computer or hpc or even super supercomputer Right, Does that answer your question, Aritra? Thank you, thank you. And uh, the next one is, is the development of quantum sensors in GPS systems? Yeah, well, again, they're, they're looking to use uh, quantum sensors for environments where GPS is denied, right? Where you can't use GPS. So uh, as I mentioned, Jack Hittery, had a great quote about work he's doing with Sandbox AQ, his company, which is focused on AI and quantum. Uh, they're also focused on cybersecurity solutions, but they're also looking at ways to use quantum sensors for the undersea exploration, if you will, um, as well as in, in outer space, non-terrestrial applications. Thank you. Uh, the next one question is, can you give a guess on how many of companies would accept remote non-US employees? It's a great question, and I don't really have an answer. I think it's a bit of a moving target. Um, that said, I would encourage you to apply. If you find a job uh, in a job rec on a career page or whatever that you think is interesting, and you have, and my advice is if you have 50% of the skills, 
uh, rather than 90%, I would encourage you to apply, apply for the job. Um, worst case, you won't hear from them. Best case, you'll get a interview, get, get a conversation. And certainly, you know, working remotely is much more widely accepted. People, companies are much more comfortable with this approach since the pandemic, right? We've all discovered we can be productive in our pajamas. Um, so I would say if you find a job that looks interesting in a company that you like, uh, where you where your um, alignment with their sort of approach as well as sort of ethics and moral position, which is key, right? How they go to market, what their portfolio is, um, I would say apply. And you know, if they if you have skills that they need, and these companies are growing quickly, right? So they're and there there's a dearth of talented people like you to take these jobs. So be proactive, be confident. Just jiggle doorknobs, send out resumes, and the right situation will will appear. The right company will will hire you. Uh, so thank you. There are a lot of comments. Wonderful, amazing, fascinating talk. So thank you, Professor, so 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 much. Thank you, thank you. Well, thank uh, you. So, yeah. mm -hmm. so here's a question from Nasser. Saying last year I gave a talk at Womanians, noticeable changes in the quantum market and the demand for quantum tech. That's a great question. Um, Nasser, I would say cybersecurity, post quantum cryptography has gotten a lot of focus in, since I last spoke at the Womanium event. The main reason being that NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, uh, released what they call their four approved quantum resistant algorithms in July, I think last year. Marlo, keep me honest here. Um, but it set off a, a furor, if you will, increased focus on how companies are going to deal with Y2Q, right? When quantum computers can crack current encryption codes. And the government, I'm not sure the status, I need to investigate, but there was a fiat saying that government agencies, again, Marlo, keep me honest, had to provide a plan, I think it was by May 4th, for how they were going to deal with addressing this harvest now, decrypt later uh, threat. You know, who they're going to work with, what data they're going to capture and protect, uh, where they're going to store it, how they're going to address it. Now, keep in mind, these kinds of transitions, you know, take a decade maybe to make this kind of major transition from one technology solution to another. But there's a lot of focus on that. So I would say, the net net, that's a long answer, but the net net is if you're interested in getting involved in quantum and you have interest in skills in cybersecurity or a background in that space, uh, those companies are looking to find smart people, talented employees to hire and bring on board to help address this surge in interest, right? Thank you, thank you. Uh, so we have also a question. Science IBM is moving into quantum system uh, to by any chance. Is there a market to buy old IBM system quantum one? I guess there is. <laughs> I mean, if you have like a million dollars laying around. But again, the, the model is cloud-based, right? So these machines are expensive to build and support and update. Uh, I don't think you're going to see a IBM quantum system on your desk anytime soon. Uh, so what I was—I don't know if they're going to reduce the rate. The question might imply: Will you get discounted access to a system one, their quantum one? Um, I doubt it. Being IBM, they need the big margin. <laughs> uh, but you, I don't—I don't think they're selling any of those system system ones, quantum one solutions. It's a funny question. Thank you. Thank you. And the last one is how many companies in Southeast Asia can you see uh, come up in the next 10 years? Uh, I think we're going to see more and more companies. I was at an event called Quantum Tech APAC in Singapore about a month ago. And there are lots of companies focused on you know, the, the value of quantum. Uh, there was a young startup in a young guy from Thailand who's got a quantum computing startup. He's working with IBM, actually. There was a gentleman from the Philippines. There was a team from Vietnam. Uh, Singapore certainly has a lot of focus. They have like a national quantum initiative uh, that's funded and supported, I think, by the government as well as private sector companies. 
Um, certainly, Australia, there's a lot of focus that Company Q Control that I mentioned. There's a company called DRAC in Australia that's building a silicon based quantum uh, you know, qubit company. So, yeah, I think we're going to see lots of opportunity coming out of uh, Southeast Asia in the next 10 years. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for a very nice uh, talk and uh, all answers on, on all, all, all these questions. So thank you. Thank you. And well, thank I you. have to 